It's time for your wrestling nostalgia, and today we're going back to the year 2006 to a pay-per-view called New Year's Revolution, where Edge cashes in against John Cena. It all starts right after this. So you guys know that we live in a world that's full of social media, technology, information sharing. What about your privacy and security? Have you guys thought about that? I take it very seriously, and that's why I purchased the Simple Proactive Privacy and Security book. It's by a military veteran, Alex Summers, who got fed up and worked to reduce the digital tracking of his family. It's the book that Silicon Valley doesn't want you reading. I mean, think about it, guys. We all make phone calls, okay? We do channel surfing. We do web browsing. We all know we're all over social media. Everything we do gets tracked. This book can help you avoid the bait of phishing attacks, remove yourself from 27 people located websites that share our names, addresses, and other private information. There's a password manager and password generator. Protect your calls, your texts, everything. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're using iPhone, Android, if you have a PC or a Mac. Right now, this is the book that you guys need to check out. It's only $9.99 for paperback or $4.99 for Kindle. I'm going to be putting up a link on my Twitter, which is at WWE at the WWE podcast. So check it out. I would really recommend if you guys want to take this privacy thing seriously in a day and age where everything is shared, definitely check this out. Again, I'll be putting a link on my Twitter feed or just go on to Amazon and search the simple proactive privacy and security. Again, that's simple, proactive privacy and security, and get you and your family secured today. It's time for your weekly fix of wrestling nostalgia when we look at wrestling's past eras from the Attitude Era to the Reality Era. I'd like to think that maybe this company will be better after Vince McMahon's dead, but the fact is, it's it's going to get taken over by his idiotic daughter and his doofus son-in-law and the rest of his stupid family. To today, here on the WWE Podcast. Welcome to the WWE Podcast. It is Sunday, July 21st, 2019. And this is one of my favorite parts of the week. It's the beginning of the week, but it's also your wrestling nostalgia portion. And I get to travel back in time. You get to travel back in time with me. And if you haven't seen these particular matches or moments that I bring up, again, I always recommend that you do because it is just, it's so important, I think, as a wrestling fan to see these moments because they were significant and are still significant today. So, uh, again, thank you for joining me. And today, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the show, it is a time that we're going to travel back to called New Year's Revolution, not resolution, New Year's Revolution 2006 that took place in Albany, New York. And uh, yours truly was there in person and had ringside seats right behind the announcer's of Jim Ross and Jerry the King Lawler at the time. I went with a couple of friends, and uh, it was quite a show, and really quite a show for the uh, the one reason of Edge cashing in against John Cena. And it was shocking. It uh, the, the crowd reaction was just awesome, which I'm going to definitely dive into. And just the feeling of that, um, it was new at the time, newish, with the, uh, the Money in the Bank briefcase concept. Again, the concept that was originally started at WrestleMania. Don't forget that. It, it was at WrestleMania. This is not something that was, at its uh, this time, having its own pay-per-view. So um, just, just a, a great moment. And as always, don't worry, I will be sharing some audio with you guys as well, I mean that, that that's a fun part too because you get to hear it live and not just hear my voice. It breaks things up, and you get to hear the moment as it happened. So that's also coming in just a few moments. But first, again, welcome. This is the WWE podcast where you get four shows a week. This is a wrestling nostalgia version on Sunday, a break Monday, and then Tuesday is the Raw review. Wednesday is the SmackDown live review, and Thursday is the uh, bring a co-host on and talk about everything in between day that is one of my favorite days as well um so you get if you like me just solo you get that a few days a week you also get a co-host and you get to tra- travel back in time so i think i'm pretty much hitting all fronts i hope so again thank you so much for joining me and uh you can follow me on twitter 
at the WWE Podcast. Also check out the website at wwepodcast.com because on that site you'll be able to check out some new articles that were recently published and uh, a lot of other podcasts on there too. If you haven't caught up and you're new to the show, well, you can check all of them out there if you want to or if you have a podcast app. I'm not even going to mention every podcast I'm on, that I'm on because at this point, I don't think I'm not on any. How about just put it that way? I mean, it's, it's, it should be everywhere. Let me just put it that way. So, um, guys, uh, I, I'm ready to, to travel back in time if you guys are too. It's it's one of my favorite memories, and maybe I'm a little bit biased because of the fact that I was in person, live there in Albany, New York. Uh, you know, I was ringside. I got to take my seat home. No idea where that folding chair is, though. No idea. Uh, it had the New Year's Revolution uh, logo on it with John Cena with the chain around his neck and the chamber in the background. Um, and this is also, don't forget, too, a time when New Year, the Elimination Chamber wasn't its own pay-per-view. So think about this. They've gimmicked the Money in the Bank briefcase to having its own pay-per-view, and they gimmicked the Elimination Chamber to have its own pay-per-view. So, uh, again, a much different time when you think about it. 13, almost 14 years ago now, I mean, we're, we're rolling past 2019 here, but 13 and a half years ago that this match took place. And uh, I don't know if you'd really call it a match. It was more of just uh, Edge coming out, cashing in and winning the belt and walking out. But the most interesting part to me, being in person, was not just John Cena losing. It was the reaction of the audience. So uh, after I play the clip for you, which I'm going to do in just a moment, I want to give you guys a little bit of insight as to where John Cena stood at the time in WWE and where Edge stood at the time and what the crowd was like all night towards John Cena and towards Edge, who actually lost earlier in the night to Ric Flair. Um, Ric Flair defeated Edge by disqualification. So that was for the Intercontinental Championship at the time. Um, And while I'm at it, here's a little bit of a rundown, too, of what the card was. Check these names out. Ready? Chavo Guerrero defeated Snitsky. Remember, Mr. It Wasn't My Fault, who caused a miscarriage with Lita? Because Kane impregnated Lita, and then Snitsky accidentally hit Lita, and his whole catchphrase became it wasn't my fault it was just imagine that on wwe tv today oh my god okay and then the second match was rick flair defeating edge with lita by disqualification trish stratus defeated mickey james for the wwe women's championship it still was not the divas championship thank god jerry the king lawler lawler defeated gregory helms in a singles match triple h defeated the big show Shelton Benjamin, with Mama Benjamin, my God, defeated Viscera. Oh, boy. This is a sign of the times. Here we go. Ashley Massaro, who recently uh, passed, as we all know, defeated Candice Michelle, Maria, Tori Wilson, and Victoria. Oh, but don't worry. Here's the stipulation that tells you what time it, what, what year we're in. It was a bra and panties gauntlet match. My God, imagine the uproar if a match like that happened today. Just imagine that. Take a moment and think about if, and this is only 13 years ago, imagine WWE holding a bra and panties match. Think about just the backlash, no pun intended, that the the corporation would have. Oh, my God. And, again, I was never a fan of the bra and panties matches because that's not what I watch wrestling for. If I wanted that kind of stuff, I wouldn't watch wrestling, right? There's a lot of other sources for this kind of stuff that are not wrestling. Uh, But, anyway, I mean, just think about this. This is the time that WWE was in. But uh, Ashley Massaro won, as we all remember, right? Uh, John Cena then defeated – these are the individuals that were in the chamber match – Carlito, Chris Masters – Kane, Kurt Angle, and Shawn Michaels. Whew. Boy. Uh, man, I mean, you think back to when you took for granted you're seeing the, you know, these individuals in their prime, like Kurt, uh, Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels. Man, uh, you just took it for granted. You just did. And at that time, I was 21 years old. 
I was 21 years old in uh, 2006. Although, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, I was 20 because my birthday's in February. I was still 20. I was not even legal to drink when this pay-per-view happened. My God. Uh, and then, of course, we got Edge accompanied by Lita defeating John Cena where Edge cashed in his Money in the Bank uh, contract. So, and don't forget, Edge had won that championship, as I said, at WrestleMania. But that was April. They waited a cool nine, nine months to cash that in. My God, think about that. That's great stuff. A match that was only one minute and 46 seconds. So let me just give you guys some audio, and then I'm going to come back in the back end and and give you guys more of an in-person experience from what I remember. I know it was 13 and a half years ago, but this really sticks in my mind. So, uh, And and, and a particular, very uh, interesting interaction that I had with Lillian Garcia. Not a long exchange, but something she said to myself and my friends that I was with at the time. So that was just something interesting. So we'll talk about that. But here's the, the clip and the audio from that match. This individual is cashing in his money and the bank privilege that he earned at WrestleMania. The no. WWE Championship match will take place right here, right now. Oh my. John Cena defends against Edge. He's for human. Well, I thought, and I said it earlier tonight, are you kidding me? That Edge would use it at WrestleMania. But Edge is cashing in, and cashing it in big time when John Cena is at his weakest. Oh, no, 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 baby. no, 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 no. Turn around, Johnny boy. Turn around. No. It's over. Don't Edge turn is around. just waiting on the WWE champ. It's waiting on him. Oh, it the it he hit the spear. He hit the spear. the spear. Combo. Two. Did he get it? No, he didn't. How in the world did John Cena kick out of that? Was it a three or a two? It was a two. It was a two. And Edge is in total disbelief. I don't think Edge is the only one in disbelief. After all that Cena's gone through. Look at Edge now. He can't believe it. The disbelief now turning to frustration and anger. You can see the face of Edge changing. Oh, no, not another spear. That, but I guess Edge figures that's what it's going to take. Edge will spear John Cena over and over again if he has to. Oh, no. and again. Cover. He got it. My God, what has happened here tonight? Are you? I can't believe it! I can't believe it! This was indeed a historical night! Edge has shocked the world! Well, I'll tell you what he's done. He's stolen the damn title! So I stand corrected. Uh, It was actually Joey Styles. Uh, on commentary, not Jim Ross. But Jerry King Lawler Lawler was there and coach. So uh, quite an interesting match there. And yes, it was only a minute and a half and it, it, you know we all know the outcome, but the interesting, most interesting part to me is the crowd reaction. And you know this is a time of John Cena just beginning to really catch fire. I mean, he was and was starting to become the top guy at the time. We've seen John Cena with the championship before, and it was, I think, the blowback of the quote hardcore fans the the older male demographic that attended that pay-per-view myself included never related to John Cena and still don't I still don't go to an event and cheer for John Cena he's got a lot of that he he just has the PG feel to him he never connected with me on the level that Stone Cold or The Rock did even though he may have drawn the more money than them over that period of time he was on top uh, and he was their top guy forever and ever. Doesn't matter to me. I still, still just, I respect the hell out of him, but he's just not a guy at my demographic I would ever cheer for. I just don't have that connection for him. I don't, I don't live vicariously through him. And I still didn't, and I still don't, and I didn't back then. So 
uh, I think there was a blowback from the male demo who was there in large part. You know, it wasn't a lot of families at this pay-per-view. Again, remember, this is prior to PG. This was a time when it was still TV-14. Um, John Cena was bloody and battered during that uh, Elimination Chamber match. So when by the time Edge got there, it was just John Cena in a pool of his blood. Uh, Edge's first time winning here. And the crowd, I was into it. All my friends were into it, um, and we were booing the hell out of John Cena all night long, just all night. I mean, it, it's kind of the same dynamic that Roman Reigns has today with the male demo. He doesn't have a male demo unless you're over the age of 13. You do not have a male demo. And it was the same thing with John Cena. He had the kids and the, and the women, and when you go to an event like this, that was the TV 14 era, and it was a late at night pay per view on a Sunday when school's tomorrow. It was just a primarily male demo that was at this uh, particular pay per view, and the people. I mean, like I said, we we cheered the hell out of uh, anybody but John Cena at that point. And I think I don't think we we're alone. And so my inter- little interaction that I had with uh, Lillian Garcia, we were booing him so bad and so loud. At least my section was. That Lillian turns to us, looks directly at me. I just was kind of the spokesman for the uh, the group, I guess. And she says, geez, tell me how you really feel. And I, I just look at her. I'm like, uh, we are. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean I, it was just kind of like she was almost pissed off that we were booing John Cena. Kind of like, uh, geez, like, come on, guys. And it's, you know, looking back now, I would have, you know, I, I probably would have said something different. Um, you know, hey, like I purchased my ticket. I can cheer and boo who I want. It was almost as if she was getting annoyed. I wasn't following. And we, as a collective, weren't following the script. I mean, just the way that she said it and the way she looked at us, almost in disgust. Uh, Now I'm talking about it. I'm kind of pissed off about it. (laughs) I mean, 13 and a half years later. But now I'm like really starting. I haven't thought about this memory in in detail and at this length in quite a while. So now that I'm thinking about it, it's kind of pissing me off. Um, But... No, we just said back to her, look, like, I mean, like, uh, we are. And we just continued to boo the hell out of John Cena. And Lillian, Lillian Garcia was very taken back because I think we were the first group. And I'm talking about not just myself and my friends. I'm talking about the, the arena that held about 15,000 people at the time. It was the Pepsi Arena, I believe. And uh, we were the first group as a collective on that scale to boo John Cena. And, uh, you know, it, it, I think she was just taken back by it. The, the crowd loved it, loved having Edge spear the hell out of John Cena, who, after going through hell in that Elimination Chamber match, comes out on top. He's super Cena. Uh, we're just like, oh, my God. And the whole we've seen enough uh, signs that were up. It was a very, very anti-Cena crowd, I'll, I'll tell you that. And uh, I was proud of I was proud of Albany. I was proud of Albany, New York, I got to say. So uh, way to go, guys. There's your pat on the back 13 years later. And so it, it was... It was uh, the match itself was very good from what I remember, but that cash in being a part of that, having Edge come out and spear the hell out of John Cena after you go, oh my god, not again! Nobody expected it. I didn't because for, you got to remember too, the Money in the Bank concept was relatively new, and when when Edge was carrying it for nine months, you don't expect him to cash it in. You almost forget that he's carrying it. It just becomes part of who he is and what he carries to the ring. And what's also interesting is that Vince McMahon came out to make that announcement. Now think about how it's cashed in. I mean, you just run to the ring and hand it to the referee. So Vince McMahon made it a part of what he did. And Edge handed that briefcase to him. And then Vince McMahon, uh, I I guess, took that as an official cash in. And that's clearly not how we do it today. But it was a very cool moment to have Edge come out. I've always been an Edge fan. I mean... When he was in Edge and Christian, like I found them entertaining. They were great in the tag team match. We all remember remember them for the TLC matches they have with the Dudleys and the Hardys. We remember that. But when Edge finally broke away, and I remember they tried to make him babyface, and the crowd just said, no, 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 we're not buying this. They started booing him. So they turned him heel. And he was great as a heel. Think about how good Edge was as a heel. Edge, I don't think, is talked about enough. 
I, I really don't think he is. For the contributions that he made, think about the matches that he's had. I mean, even with The Undertaker, the rivalry he had against The Undertaker, who he also cashed in when he won the Money in the Bank briefcase again. He cashed in against The Undertaker. But that program he had with Undertaker is also noteworthy. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Culminating in a uh, WrestleMania 20... Uh, oh, boy. WrestleMania 23, I think it was. I think. Oh, uh, boy. WrestleMania 23, the one that Ric Flair retired at. Undertaker and uh, John Cena. Or excuse me, Undertaker and Edge had their program as well. Undertaker ended up beating Edge. Um, but Undertaker and Edge had a, a very, very believable, very enjoyable program. Um, and, and something that I'm now talking myself into going back and watching as well. Uh, but... Edge as a, a single star, I think, was more successful than he was as a tag team. I really believe that. I mean, Edge and Christian, we all know who E and C were. We all know the, the you know, for those with the benefit of Flash photography and uh, the five-second pose or whatever all stuff he did, all that stuff. Great stuff. And they were a good comedy act, but also can be taken seriously. And then when he went serious, and when he joined forces with Lita, who I think added to his character. Man, he, he was on fire. He was a very good promo. I think an underrated promo. Edge was just great in the ring, great on the mic, knew how to cut a heel promo, and he was very believable. Like, you could look into his eyes, and I can't see through what he's saying. I believe everything that Edge says. How many times can you say that about guys today? It was just great. Great, great, great stuff. Uh, and so Edge, I, I got, you know, I'm starting to go on a little bit of a tangent as far as uh, you know, what this topic is about. But, uh, you know, Edge was a, is somebody that I don't think is often talked about enough. How often do you hear talk, people talking about Edge and praising his matches or uh, his singles run or anything like that? So I don't know. I, I just uh, love it. And I'd really recommend you guys go back. I know it's only a minute and a half, but just listen to the reaction. You, and put yourself back in the time, and you have to remember. John Cena was getting cheered for the most part. You had your booze, but they were drowned out by the women and the children at most Raws, okay, and SmackDowns, uh, especially house events. So I think it was a shock to the system of Lillian Garcia, for sure. Uh, John Cena and Edge, who probably did not, who did not expect to get that kind of reaction. I don't believe that he expected to be cheered like he was the, you know, the hometown hero. It was great. And if you didn't know this, Edge, the name Edge, actually came from an Albany, New York radio station that he was listening to when he was trying to come up with a name. And one of our radio stations name was the Edge or something like I forget what it was, where the Edge radio station came from. But we did have one at one point. It doesn't exist now. But when he was here, he heard the name of the radio station um, Edge and he took it. So we the collective we, Albany, New York, are responsible for the name Edge, which is a damn cool name. The rated R superstar. Imagine the rated R superstar in a PG era. Yeah. <laughs> the rated PG superstar. I mean, maybe PG-13. Um, just great stuff. And I'd, uh, I would, I'd love to, I'd love to uh, have you guys go back and watch it again if you have before or haven't yet. Please do. I also think that the part of the reaction, one last note here well, before I move on to some other news, is that, yes, part of the reaction was probably because, oh, it's a cash-in. We're part of the moment. We're part of history. It's just cool. It's happening. So they're cheering something big that was happening. Uh, and, you know, you hear that now, even when a heel cashes in against a baby face, that people cheer or you hear yelling because it's, oh, they're part of, oh, I was there when. I remember when they were here and I did that. I'm here for the cash in. Oh, I feel special. So people get excited about things when they feel like they're a part of something, especially part of history and something that doesn't happen too often. So, yes, maybe a small part of that reaction was that and not knowing that. Um, but I think the majority, 90% of those, that positive reaction for Edge was just anti-Cena and uh, anybody but Cena. <laughs> I mean, I think that was really it. Um, all right. So I want to touch on a little bit about uh, Monday Night Raw tomorrow night, which is emanating from Tampa, Florida, the site of WrestleMania 36 next year. Uh, and boy, do they have a just a, a lineup for 
the ages. I mean, at least in recent memory. Um, I mean, when you look at who is going to be there, it's pretty extensive. Um, you have Stone Cold Steve Austin, who is the headline of the Raw reunion. You have Hulk Hogan on that uh, on that roster for tomorrow night. You have Ric Flair, Shawn Michaels. Boy, uh, you have Santino Morella, Mick Foley, among others. Oh, and the the Bellas. Okay, now WWE is putting up some pretty damn interesting uh, posts here on their site. And they're coming up with, like, fantasy matches that we'd love to see. As they titled it, Raw Reunion Fantasy Warfare Matches We'd Love to See. And headlining that, among uh, the next one I'm going to read, but is The Rock versus Roman Reigns. And it's interesting that they put The Rock as a picture of him with hair, you know, when he was, like, I don't know, it was, like, 2002. It's like the 2002 haircut. I don't know why they did that. It's bizarre. But they build it as two warriors, one dynasty, family versus family. And kind of like an old school, uh, you know, you'd see in your local paper for an independent wrestling promotion type of look. It's interesting. Uh, It's kind of a throwback look that they've put on this uh, particular fake ad for this matchup that's a fantasy matchup. And now The Rock's not even scheduled to be there. They did not have The Rock on the schedule of him being live on Raw. They didn't have him in that list, the complete list that WWE put out. So I don't know what they're doing here. Maybe they didn't. They let it slip that he's going to be there. I don't know. Like, why would you have The Rock versus Roman Reigns on the uh, on a fantasy board for the Raw reunion when The Rock's not supposed to even be there? He's not scheduled to appear. And maybe it's a surprise. Maybe they spoiled it and didn't know. I, I don't know the, the game here, but... I think that this, particularly this match, is probably one in which they are, WWE is, oh, it's a fantasy match. We, we, we'd love to see this. And they're also, at the same time, gauging the reactions of fans to see if it's something they should pursue and take seriously. If WWE is, if they should take it seriously based on the fans' reactions to this fantasy matchup. I'd love to see it. I've been talking about this for four or five years now. I'd love to see this. I'd, I actually wanted to see it back when The Rock tried to come out and save Roman Reigns from being booed out of the building in Philadelphia in 2015. I've wanted to see it since then. Uh, I, I would love it. I think Roman Reigns would come out on top, unfortunately, so I think the outcome would piss me off. Um, and so it's the people's champ, The Rock, versus the big dog, Roman Reigns. My God, can we please get rid of the big dog? He's not the big dog. If I hear Michael Cole lose his voice over saying it one more time through a forced uh, overreaction through his headset of Vince McMahon telling him, call him the big dog. I, it just sounds so stupid and contrived. It's so contrived and forced. Ugh, I can't stand when they call Roman the big dog. It's, it's, uh, just, it doesn't fit him. Find something else. Call him the silent killer. I don't care. That's more accurate than the big dog. It's just... Oh, it's just such a... All right, I'm going to keep going before I complain too much, right, guys? All right. Uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Kevin Owens is the next, quote, fantasy match, and they build it as this. Two Rebels, one cause. A truly stunning matchup. Uh, And this is something I, I, I would love to see this match. And you know what? I actually believe that these two will have interaction on Raw. I think these two will have uh, some kind of interaction physical or otherwise these two individuals pass will cross tomorrow night you can bank on that and yes as this outline says they both use the stunner that's not the only thing that they have in common says this article uh this hypothetical battle goes far deeper than a shared finishing maneuver austin and owens are both rebels who have rarely if ever conformed to what a wwe superstar should look like sound or act like they both never met a microphone they couldn't set ablaze or an authority figure that they wouldn't speak truth to. And yes, the stunner thing practically writes itself too. Interesting. Interesting little uh, little deal there. Um, if I was going to put a, a, a stamp on what happens, I don't know. If Kevin Owens was a heel right now, I would say that Kevin Owens ends up on the receiving end of a stone-cold stunner. 
I, I still think that could happen with a less likely chance. I think the more likely scenario is they both end up giving stunners to whoever, I don't know, two or three guys comes out to interrupt them. I think you're going to get a Stone Cold stunner and, uh, or you're going to get a Kevin Owens stunner and the original Stone Cold stunner um, where they both work in tandem and both share beers together. Because if he leaves Kevin Owens laying, I, I don't know if that's going to be good for Kevin Owens' push. As much as I'd like to see it, because it'd be cool, like to Kevin Owens take a stunner, Kevin Owens is gaining momentum right now. For him to be just laying, left laying with beer all over him, I love the Stone Cold stunner, but right now Kevin Owens is the future. And, you know, I mean, so I don't know if I'd do it. I would just have them both give tandem stunners to a pair of, you know, no-name heels or whatever and have them leave them laying and Kevin Owens and Stone Cold share a beer together, clash some beers, drink some beer, and, you know, everyone goes wild and uh, Kevin Owens gets the rub. That would be m- the way I'd book it. And, you know, that, that would be how I'd do it. The Bella Twins versus the Iconics. How about that? That would actually be something I'd be interested in seeing just for the fact of they have very interesting personalities or in personalities that are somewhat similar I, I don't think that this would be a particularly uh, well-paced or well-executed wrestling match. This would probably be more of personality-based than wrestling-based. And that would be fine, but, I mean, is this really a fantasy match? Eh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but it's one I would pay attention to. But, oh, and uh, Alundra Blades versus Becky Lynch. This one is billed at two trailblazers. Get set to burn the house down. Yeah, I mean, interesting. Yeah, I guess if Alundra Blaze was in her prime and you know not in you know bordering on senior citizen, it'd probably be a better match, right? I mean, this of course is more of a fantasy match than uh, the rest of them are. I-, I think of in order of possibilities, I would put Rock versus Roman Reigns at the most probable. Uh, Maybe Nikki and Bella, Nikki and Bree versus Peyton and Billy, and then probably Austin and Owens. I mean, not that Austin I think would come out of that, but uh, I don't think he'd come out of retirement for that. But it'd be interesting. I mean, I mean they continue down the list here. I mean, you got Shawn Michaels versus Seth Rollins, the kick versus the stomp. That would be interesting to see. However, it's about fifteen years too late, or even ten years too late. If Shawn Michaels is in his prime, think about that match. Think about it. My God. I just don't need to see Shawn Michaels with his bald head. Please. I'm not one that really just craps on guys getting haircuts or growing out their hair. There was something about Shawn Michaels' hair that added so, so much to his character. Then when he lost it, I couldn't even pay attention at Crown Jewel. It it was that distracting. It was something I don't ever want to see again. So hopefully between Crown Jewel, the disaster that was, and today, Shawn Michaels has said, okay, I'm going to grow my hair out. I understand he has a receding hairline, which is why he did it. I'm fine. Look, I'm 34 years old and I shaved my head because if I didn't, it would look silly. It would look downright silly. (laughs) So (laughs) I feel you, Shawn. But your hair added so much to your character. Please. Please. Okay. But I, look, I would love to see this. I, I would love, love, love this match. Just as they paid, they tried to convince Shawn Michaels to come back to face AJ Styles a couple of years ago at WrestleMania. Uh, but this, I think, would be, wow, that would be a hell of a match. They have Diesel versus Drew McIntyre, I, I guess. I think that Drew McIntyre would do the most of the, the, the selling in that match. Um, you know, Big Daddy Cool Diesel isn't exactly known for his agile uh, you know, prowess in the ring, his finesse. So I think it would be a Drew McIntyre victory if these two were to square off. But um, I guess, I guess maybe because what they look alike, I, I, I don't know. Uh, Samoa Joe versus Mankind, no fear versus no mercy. Yeah, uh, that, again, this is all with Mankind being in his prime, and Joe being billed as a killer. Yes, you could build this to a crazy level, but again, McFoley retired ten plus years ago. And you have Samoa Joe, who is losing on a almost weekly basis. I know he won this past week against Finn Balor. I get all that, but he was left laying by Finn Balor, if you don't remember. So he didn't, even though he won the match, he looked like the loser here. So 
if he was billed the way he should be billed and Mankind was in his prime, yes. An unsanctioned match is where you go with this. So, uh, very interesting selections by WWE to bring to the forefront to like tease us. Uh, again, out of the whole list I just mentioned, I think the most realistic is The Rock versus Roman Reigns. Because The Rock can still go when he wants to and gets himself in ring shape. And Roman Reigns is in his prime. So this is probably the most likely and one that I would love to see. Again, even though I believe The Rock would lose because Roman Reigns is uh, the guy, you could use that as an opportunity to, dare I say, turn Roman Reigns heel. Dare I say that. I used to go on weekly rants of that. I have, I have subsided on that. And I have just accepted the fact that Vince will never do it. Or will he? This would be a perfect opportunity because if you believe, if you truly believe the fans will turn against The Rock to cheer Roman Reigns, you are sorely mistaken. I don't care what you have The Rock do to trash the people or what you have Roman Reigns, Mr. I Sleepwalk Through Raw and SmackDown every week, Mr. Inspirational you know, Promo, That's what he's known for. Of course, I'm being very sarcastic. If you believe that, you're fooling yourself. But I would love to see it. I think it'd be good for the the, uh, Rock. I think it'd be good for Roman Reigns, finally turning heel. Be a perfect time to do it. But uh, So tomorrow night should be interesting. Again, I don't know what the hell Hulk Hogan's doing. Hopefully nothing physical outside of a punch. I don't want to see him do one kick or one, one boot. I don't want to see him do a leg drop because I don't want to see him die. I mean... That's, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm being serious. Like, I, He's done so many of those leg drops. Number one, it would probably look awful. And number two, he's compressed his spine from doing them so many damn times. I don't need to see it. Uh, a punch at the most. Really. And, and just give me a, let me tell you something, brother, and what you're going to do. And give me your punch lines. Give me your greatest hits. And goodbye. Good night, the lights. I mean, I don't need to see much more from Hogan. I, really, I just don't. Uh, I think... Mick Foley coming back. I don't know what he's going to do. I really don't. I just don't know. I don't know the roles of these guys. And on top of it, trying to keep the storylines going from last week with Bray Wyatt's debut that was on that I believe was on fire. And some people thought it was it was terrible. I I don't know why. I don't know. I thought Bray Wyatt's debut was just lights out. It was awesome. Uh, so th- there's lots of follow up from last week that WWE needs to keep going, and I hope that they do. I really do. I, I need to see progress in their storylines and not just everything paused for a week for these uh, you know, legendary stars. If they can incorporate those stars into continuing storylines, fine. But I don't want to kind of like a sideshow of an anomaly of a show that has nothing to do with the progression of the storylines in place. I, I don't need that. I, I don't think any of us do. SummerSlam is right around the corner. Don't forget, SummerSlam is August 11th. August 11th. That's a couple of weeks away. Three weeks. Three weeks away from today. Not far. As I said, SummerSlam always feels like it's the 22nd, 23rd, 24th of August. I feel like it's coming two weeks early this year. So, WWE needs to make sure that they continue to build and progress storylines and not just try to pop a rating. Again, this is a very short-term solution. A very short-term solution for a long-term problem of WWE. They're just trying to get eyeballs on the product, which they'll do. They'll definitely pop a rating for sure with Stone Cold back on Raw, with Hogan back on Raw. You're going to get a bigger rating for sure. But what about the following week? And the week after? And the week after that, when none of them are there, and you just have the, the usual suspects there busting their ass, trying to get people to watch the product and it's just the same creative there i mean you just have to look at that and i I just hope wwe and i'm sure they are are aware of this this is a this is a simple very simple short-term solution all right so again tomorrow should be very interesting uh i'm looking forward to it i I know that it's going to be a very nostalgic night um it's going to be something that i'm sure there's going to be a ton to talk about we'll probably see a couple of stunners and I'm looking forward to that. Stone Cold is uh, my favorite of all time. I know, super interesting. Um, oh, and also, as I'm reading through some of the the notes here, as I go through my uh, news of the day with wrestling, 
the headline is that WWE SmackDown viewership shoots way up after Extreme Rules. That's uh, that's crazy. It was up from uh, 14.6% from the week before. Uh, it was the most watched episode since April 16th, which put WWE back into the number one spot on cable television for the second night in a row. Very, That's, uh, that's very unexpected. Um, but some of the reasons are that um, there was a lack of major cable and network cable and network competition on both Monday and Tuesday this week. There was also likely some interest garnered coming out of Extreme Rules. Uh, whatever it may be, I think that the other thing is, too, you have to remember, Daniel Bryan and WWE were blatantly advertising the career-altering announcement from Daniel Bryan, which has a history of major career-altering announcements, right? They never made it. So, again, that could have been the hook, too. And if they sold a bill of goods that they never followed through on, the fans aren't, aren't going to come back next week. I was pissed about that. I mentioned that on my, sh- my review show for SmackDown this week. I was pissed that WWE did not follow through with Daniel Bryan giving their, his announcement. I understand he's supposed, supposed to be a heel. He's supposed to piss us off. But this one's on the promotion because they're the ones who got behind this and advertised it ahead of time. It wasn't just Daniel Bryan coming out and saying he has a major announcement and dropping the mic unannounced coming out there saying that this was billed ahead of time. So who the hell knows? I mean, um, but it's a good sign for WWE up 14% from the week before. Very good sign. And what what I thought again was a very good show. All right. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. Uh, I'd like to bring you back in time. And this one was a little bit personal because again, I was there in, in person, but if you haven't seen that, I would definitely recommend that you do. And, uh, I hope you give me a follow if you can on WWEPodcast.com and on Twitter at the WWE Podcast. Again, if you want your ad or business mentioned here, by the way, just go to Fiverr.com and search me out. I'm actually under Matt3166, which is weird because I made that profile a long time ago and I can't change my username. So uh, you just go to Fiverr.com and search either Promote on Wrestling Podcast or just search my username, which is Matt3166. And you guys can get on this show, um, put your ad in here and reach thousands of people every week. It's a pretty cool deal. I work with podcasts. I work with uh, you know people selling their products and goods and um, everything else in between. It's, it's a lot of fun. And um, give it a try if you want to do it. Also, if you don't like the ads, on the flip side, you don't want the ads, go to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. You can get this show and all my other shows, completely ad-free, totally ad-free for a dollar. It's pretty damn good. It's a good deal, okay? Because this content is coming to you for free, just as many of the wrestling podcasts come to you for free. But if you want the ads removed, easy enough to do, right? So, all right. Well, guys, thanks so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the show. Look forward to tomorrow night. I'm sure you do too. And as always, I'll be back on Tuesday with your Raw review. Until then, I'll talk to you next time.